Okay, well, hello everybody. Welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host every week, and I'm here today with another inspiring guest, John McQuaid, who will be telling us about his story as an author and writer of the book, Tasty, the Art and Science of What We Eat. So, John, welcome to Author Story. It's a great pleasure to have you with us as, as our guest. Uh, thanks. It's, it's great to be here. All right, cool. So, uh, John, from what I understand, you've written books on such diverse topics as levee engineering, coal mining, termites, superstorms, and you even have shared in, non, in um, not one but three Pulitzers for your reporting in the New Orleans Times became. And now you have a book on food. Most authors usually focus on one thing, not several. So how did you get to be the widely read and widely reporting individual that you presently are? Um, well, it's a good question. I, uh, I worked for the Times-Picayune for about 20 years, and right. uh, for, I guess, most of that time, or about half of that time, I was doing investigative uh, projects, okay. which dealt with a bunch of different topics, um, including some of those that you mentioned. Right. And uh, I, I'm just, in general, I'm interested in a lot of things. I like to know how things work. Kind of okay. dig into stuff that uh, is going on just uh, normal everyday life yet is uh, run you know, underneath it there are all these systems humming that make things work and so I've always been interested in finding out how those systems work how they came to be how they break huh. down okay. uh, so I, while working for the Times Speak Union and, and afterward when I after I left I continued to do that I, and so I looked into a number of topics most of them, of them environmental in nature, uh, okay. just as the world is a complex place, the environment where you have people interacting with nature and uh, things going wrong uh, in okay. spectacular ways. Uh, all right, all right, right. I, I found that uh, quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> I became interested in uh, taste uh, because uh, I got a little burned out uh, reporting on the environment and uh, okay. disasters right. uh, because it is it's not a, a pleasant uh, situation out there uh -huh. um, and I, I wanted to do something that was more of a uh, pure uh, scientific topic mm. um, and uh, it I came to this topic because I uh, was having trouble feeding my children, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> both of whom, uh, since they were very small, were very picky eaters, right. uh, and yet their pickiness did not overlap. They liked different things. Uh, my okay. son liked very spicy foods. He liked to be bombarded, you know, have a sensory uh, bombardment overwhelming him <laughs> going on. <laughs> uh, my daughter All preferred right. for uh, comfort type foods, okay. uh, like white foods, you know, like mashed potatoes and right. mac and cheese and things like that. And so I wondered, why is this that these two uh, human beings who are uh, similar genetically and living in the same uh, environment, uh, why would their tastes diverge so dramatically? Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, you know, so I began to dig into that topic. I wanted to try to look at what some of the uh, forces that were molding their uh, sensations uh, were, both in food and in, uh, you know, childhood development and genetics right. and things. So uh, that's what got me going on, on this topic and kind of how it grew out of uh, everything else. I see. Okay, cool. So, uh, John, if I might ask, uh, what is your... I mean, you've covered a whole bunch. Let me, let me just go back a little bit, because you you've like covered a whole bunch of uh, scientific uh, stories and and uh, stuff like that. What what's your background? Are you just really interested in science, or were you like a, you know a biologist or something like that, or are you just really or reporters really interested in stuff? Um, I, when I was in high school, I read a book called The Dragons of Eden by Carl Sagan right. uh, that uh, really inspired me. Um, and I said, you know, this is something I want to do because I'm interested in science. I've always been kind of interested in science, but all, also primarily I've been a writer. Okay. You know, I'm interested in kind of making, telling stories right. and, uh, you know, putting sentences together. So... Uh, so from that 
point, I was always looking for ways to combine uh, stuff I find out about science with uh, right. you know, mm-hmm. my, the ability that I have to uh, tell stories about it. Um, mm-hmm. I do not have a you know a scientific uh, an academic background in science. I mean, okay. I, while in college, I was an English major. I uh-huh. worked on college paper. I briefly attempted to. Uh, do a double major in engineering, but uh, I kind of uh, flunked out of uh, fluid mechanics, and so I gave up on that. Yeah, okay. um, but uh, so anyway, but yeah, my interest is is longstanding, and you know, I I've kind of kept it up over time. Right. Okay. I got that. And I guess it shows your body of work. I mean, um, three shared Pulitzer prizes. That's uh, that's a, really an indication to me. And I guess to our listeners as well, the kind of quality of, you know, the quality of the work that you put into your stories. Um, yeah, well, uh, th- uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Times Picayune um, <clears throat> during the time I was working there was really a quite a marvelous place to work. They were putting uh, a lot of resources into doing deep dives into different topics of, of importance to the local readership. Um, New Orleans in particular it has a lot of weird things going on okay, as, uh, okay. as you might imagine <laughs> it, right. uh, environmentally uh, socially um, and so this came up in a lot of the, uh, the work that we did um, you know me and a bunch of other colleagues there right, uh, right. We, we looked at one of the big uh, projects we did looked at uh, Collapsing uh, fish populations around the world, and okay. how this was uh, affecting uh, people in the Gulf of Mexico. And right. how the fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico were part of this, you know, global uh, fish market, uh, um, and uh, how uh, scientists and regulators were trying to, uh, you know, limit fishing, but fishermen were pushing back against that, and right. okay. you know, the kind of science, how you try to manage people using scientific information you know, people who are you know have local knowledge you know, very detailed local knowledge but not scientific knowledge you know it, it's a big clash it's kind of a, a paradigm of a lot of the problems we face now with you know people saying uh, you know the world is warming up and you know a lot of people right. saying well, it's not warming up you know where I am or you know <laughs> people throwing snowballs uh, okay. You know, in the uh, Congress and and the like, so um, so uh, being in New Orleans and looking at a lot of problems that manifested there um, okay. really kind of opened. Uh, you could really look at a lot of fascinating issues that reached out across different topics. Um, uh, you know, we also uh, another uh, topic probably the. Uh, most important uh, from a, a human standpoint we, we looked at was uh, the rising sea level. Uh-huh. New Orleans is, of course, as everybody now knows, is sinking slowly in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, yeah. The sea level in the Gulf of Mexico is rising. Right. This puts it at uh, uh, an escalating risk of hurricanes and particularly flooding from hurricanes. Yes, yes. So uh, we did a series of stories uh, three years before Katrina that suggested that New Orleans might be destroyed by a hurricane. Okay. Um, and here's how it would happen. And uh, uh, New Orleans, of course, is uh, essentially a bowl surrounded by uh, hurricane levees. Yes. Um, and so if you breach those levees or overflow the levees, you know, the entire city is at risk. And that, of course, is exactly what happened in the uh, in Katrina, and yeah. uh, we're still dealing with that uh, ten years later. So right, all right, I got that. So very interesting uh, place and very interesting times, I would say. So uh, John, uh, Taste has been, you know, let, let's let's go on to your uh, the book uh, and actually the topic of taste. Uh, taste has been like sort of like a stepchild where scientific inquiry is concerned. I mean. Like, I remember in elementary school, I was just taught the four basic tastes of the tongue and doing experiments on it, and I really couldn't differentiate where the heck the bitter was coming from, where the sweet was coming from, and stuff like that. Um, 
so I guess back then the map of the tongue was kind of simple and from what I understand now the map of taste and how it goes about is not so not so simple so how different is our present knowledge of taste and flavor compared to what I was taught way 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 back when um, well the uh, state of knowledge is evolving very rapidly um, okay. uh, way back when uh, there was a, of course this tongue map which uh, divided the tongue into different regions yes. which could detect the four what were known as the four basic tastes which are uh, bitter, salty, sour, and sweet. Yes. Um, this, however, the, the map itself was based on a scientific mistake that had occurred mm. you know, decades earlier. All right, and somehow, okay. <laughs> through a game of, uh, of scientific telephone, right. uh, this mistake became sort of a common knowledge or you know something everybody knew, and right. this diagram became you know used in. Uh, Elementary schools. Yeah, to, yeah. To um, uh, that was uh, before, just before more sophisticated molecular biology techniques were developed, where you mm -hmm. can actually, scientists can now look at what's going on on a molecular level okay. on the tongue. Right. And when you can do that, you can pretty easily see that uh, taste is not like. It's not like a map that's divided with clean, <laughs> uh, clean lines, you know, boundaries right. between the right. tastes. Every part of the tongue can taste all of the tastes. In fact, uh -huh. every taste bud can detect all of the taste, tastes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one of the many ways that the understanding of taste has been changing uh, in the last uh, 20 years, basically. Uh, there's just been a revolution in, in understanding, and you know, every day new uh, new uh, information comes out. Mm, all right, I got that. Uh, so, what what triggered uh, this this revolution, this this change, this scientific research recently done on taste, and well, also I guess related would be smell and flavor. What triggered this? Was there a new curiosity? Was it a change in technology? Uh, a combination of those things. Um, right. Once they uh, decoded the human genome, right. um, that the ability to easily, you know, relatively speaking, easily and cheaply uh, decode genes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is a phenomenon of the last 20 years, it gets cheaper to do this every year. Um, that makes it much easier for scientists to uh, study stuff that's going on in the body because right. you have different uh, taste receptors are expressed by individual genes. Mm -hmm. So if you know what those genes are, you can study the you know how taste works on a molecular level. So, mm. uh, for example, um, a bitter taste receptor is a protein. There is a gene for it in your in your you know the long <laughs> strings of your DNA okay, that okay. programs you know how the tongue uh, expresses these receptors, which are you know which basically grab onto chemicals in the you know that are in your mouth and then send a signal right. to your brain you know okay. bitter bitter. So if you can decode that, then you can you can you, know, you can clone bitter receptors in a in a petri dish. You can uh -huh. experiment uh -huh. on them. You can do all kinds of things. Wow! Uh, you can study how they evolved. Okay. Uh, you can uh, kind of uh, manipulate them to figure out how to make this bad stuff taste good. Right. right. Uh, so corporations get involved in okay. using this. Uh, this uh, technology. Right. So there's just all kinds of things driving this uh, information. Mm. Um, and of course, this the, m the most interesting thing about it is it shows how tastes work. Okay. Um, we found out, for example, that we have lots and lots of different bitter receptors. Okay. There's only like okay. uh, a handful of genes for something like sweetness. Okay. Um, but bitterness is much more diverse. Uh, uh -huh. Partly because um, we have like two dozen bitter genes, wow, and each okay. one of these has its own receptor. And right. each each of us in each of us the kind of patterns of what these receptors do 
vary. So everybody has a different range of sensitivity to different bitter chemicals. Okay. Um, so, for example, there's uh, some people are non-tasters, uh, what are called non-tasters, which means there's a particular bitter chemical that you can't taste. And I'm I mean mm. non-taster. <laughs> I think um, they really, really can't taste that particular flavor of bitter. I mean, it's right. like, totally tastes them. Okay, I got it's that. It's just like if you put it in water, it just it doesn't taste like anything. It's just water. Right. However, a different person who is uh, genetically programmed to be able to detect this tastes the same thing. It will taste horrible. Okay, um, all right, okay. Uh, and so uh, there's all these variations among populations and among people in what people can taste that we're just beginning to understand you know why why is that uh, uh-huh. what's, where does it come from uh, how can we uh, you know what's it say about being human about how we evolved and things like that so right. there's just all these interesting questions that this uh, raises all right I got that so it's interesting that you mentioned that taste is uh, to a certain extent genetic um, what what I was just and I was just thinking, because uh, what, what he told me the story about your kids, I was thinking of my sister and myself. Because uh, when I was growing up, I lived in an environment where the food wasn't spicy. And shortly after my sister was born, we moved to a country where spicy food was the norm. Uh, now the thing was, you know, I never got the hang of spicy food. I mean, I eat something spicy. It's like, uh, you know, spice saying, you'll never take me alive and it's going to go down screaming and kicking. Well, with my sister, she eats spicy food all the time, and you know she's not affected by it. So, based on your research, in addition to the genes, is there some sort of cultural uh, aspect to taste that some would be more, you know, used to it than others? Some cultures would be more used to say spiciness than others. Um, yes, definitely. I mean, okay, particularly uh, um, chili spiciness, which is yes. The kind of paradigm of, of spiciness is that um, <laughs> it's an inherently aversive uh, flavor. Right, um, right, it is. It, it, it's a burning, uh, irritating sensation. Yeah. Um, it, it's something you don't want it to have. You know, if you, if you put just some capsaicin, which is the chemical that uh, causes it, right. on your tongue, it's just you know, it's horrible. Uh-huh. Um, uh, you have to learn to like it. Um, yeah. And so, okay. in so basically, you know, human the human uh, brain uh, and physiology is highly adaptable. Uh, so this is another interesting aspect of taste and flavor is that uh, people can learn to like almost anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and there have been studies done you know, that show that in cultures that have a lot of spicy food, you know, right. kids. Okay. T- little kids usually don't like it, but then you know, around a certain age, everybody starts to like it. Mm-hmm. Um, just because everybody's eating it, you get used to it, um, mm-hmm. and once you get used to it, you know, your brain is uh, habituated to it. So something that is unpleasant becomes uh, pleasant, mm-hmm. um, which right. is really uh, fascinating. Uh, it, this is not a. This is uniquely human. I mean, okay. animals. Do not like uh, chili, you know, hot chilies, right. uh, generally right. speaking, uh-huh. um, and uh, nor can they be trained to, to like it, like this stuff. <laughs> um, but right. humans okay. can, um, and uh, you know that's part of being human. It, there's no, it's not, it's sort of paradoxical. Uh, um, it has to do with culture. It has to do with right. our adaptability. You right. know, we've lived. You know, in the last ten hundred thousand years, we've lived everywhere on the planet, all these different environments, and so that adaptability is a, a very powerful uh, tool for survival. So that that has something to do with it, also. Right. Okay. I got that. Well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. I got that. So, John, based on your research, I mean, we live in the in essentially in the age of you know where food is readily available compared to. 100,000 years ago when we were hunters foragers we were living off the land um, how vital is taste to our survival in in the present world is it still vital to us or is this something more along the lines now of something like uh, you know uh, something like a curiosity or something that you know only cooks would be interested in um, well I mean obviously if you're a hunter gatherer and uh taste uh, 
the, the sensation of taste, you know, the basic taste like bitterness was thought to be a and a warning that yes. something might be poisonous, yes. Yes. Um, and uh, so useful in that regard. Um, and sweetness that something is good, uh, right. you know, uh, you know, energy present in this food, so uh, have a lot of it. Um, today, you, you might argue, obviously, that we have a food system which, for the most part, prevents us from eating poisonous stuff, though yep. not all the yep. time. <laughs> um, and uh, but. I mean, most people would argue that in here in in the U.S. or in the developed world, that uh, tastes have become uh, an Achilles heel. That right. uh, you know, that uh, food people, uh, in, food corporations uh, have developed, in particular, have developed the ability to make food that tastes really good and has little nutritional value, right, right. and that. Uh, you know this. This you know it's designed to make all your pleasure centers uh, fire simultaneously, okay. but doesn't really uh, help you build a strong body. Right, um, right. And so taste has become you know a problem. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it, it becomes you know, our greatest weakness rather than something that helps us survive. So, right. um, so. Uh, you know, I would argue that it's helpful to pay attention to your tastes and what you're eating in particular, okay. and you know what you what do you what turns you on uh, right. um, <laughs> in terms of being delicious. Okay. Uh, you know, if you're drinking a lot of sodas, uh, sugary sodas, that's not good. Yeah. Um, uh, for me personally, you know, I now pay a lot more attention to what I'm eating, how it tastes, where the flavors come from, uh-huh. how they, you know, what processes produce these uh, sensations that, I, that I'm having, and, you know, or is it worth it? <laughs> um, okay, okay. Uh, and in general, you know, obviously, food that is crafted, you know, by you in your kitchen or by, you know, by a, a nice restaurant or, you know, a virtuous uh, uh, food uh, you know, restaurant chain or whatever. Right. Is going to taste better than stuff that is mass produced and uh, uh, calculated to uh, seduce you. So, um, you know, so I think it's important to pay attention to this. Mm, all right, I got that. So, uh, getting on, getting to your book, um, what do you think the value of this book, uh, the information, and particularly the information in it? What do you think its value would be to the world? In other words, how do you think people would react to it, say, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, its impact on them? Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, as I was saying, I think that um, historically, taste has been poorly understood because yeah. we didn't really have the tools to understand it. Okay. And now that we have the tools to understand it better, um, I think often they're being used to manipulate you rather than to you know, develop a okay. a more uh, a more a person with good taste, right. uh, okay. if you will. Um, you know, so I, my hope is that people will learn something interesting um, mm-hmm. that they about themselves and about you know just the pulse of daily life. You know, what am I having right. for breakfast? Right. Um, right that they didn't know before and start thinking about it a little bit differently. Um, mm-hmm. Things are changing so fast that in 10 years or 20 years, I expect the book will be, uh, will be outdated. Okay, um, okay. Uh, and right. uh, things are, are changing fast, you know, in a good way in some uh-huh. respects in the sense that we understand more. Um, and we're also looking at, you know, how the brain processes taste. Um, okay. How all these, you know, how taste interacts with our emotions, right. uh, how you feel moment to moment, mm. um, the metabolism. You know, taste is directly tapped into, uh, you know, the gut and what's going on down there, which mm-hmm. has to do with, uh, you know, how uh, how your energy is, uh, how your body gets its energy, what is tra- transformed into fat, uh, right. which is also a big problem. So yeah, all these yeah. things are. All these connections are kind of beginning to be elucidated, so it's a it's a very exciting time. So I think the book offers a window into that. Um, uh, as I said, though things are changing so fast that it's hard to even know what things will look like in terms of what we're eating in right. uh, in five in 
five years or ten years. Um, so okay, good uh, <laughs> point. Good point. Good point. And hey, I mean, if your book serves to catalyze, you know, some necessary changes, you know, why not, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, uh, John, what's next for uh, John McQuaid? Like, what? I'm sure you're interested in a lot of topics, as you mentioned before. But what are some other topics that you may want to explore in a future book? You know, as an author in the future, are there any that um, you're interested in right now? Yeah, uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm working on a couple of ideas. I mean, d doing the taste book, I became very interested in the relationship between. Uh, Flavor and uh, feelings, as I okay. mentioned, yes. um, because uh, tastes in particular are these uh, uh, primordial reactions. You know, they're uh -huh. from an evolutionary standpoint, they're really ancient. They're sort of knee-jerk types of reactions, you know, right, chemical right. reaction. However, they are also tied closely into emotions. You know, bitterness. Of course, you can you can taste something bitter and you can feel bitter. So. Mm. What point? You know, what is that? What what does that mean? Is the feeling bitter? Does that relate to the bitter taste? Um, and neuroscientists will tell you, yes, it probably does. You know, the the, the relationship between uh, tasting something good and pleasurable and other forms of pleasure. You know, okay. um, happiness itself. You know, what what is the relationship between those things? So, um, so I'm kind of looking at emotions right now and okay. trying to figure out how to write about that. So that's right. uh, one thing I'm looking at. Well, I'm sure that'll be a very interesting book, particularly if you're the one who writes it out. <laughs> Something worth I... reading, yeah. So John, in these last few minutes, I'd now like to ask a few questions that might give all of us, listeners and all, some, more inter some, <clears throat> excuse me, some insight into who you are presently as a person. Um, would this be okay? Uh, sure. Okay, cool. So my first question is, since we're talking about taste, uh, what taste do you like? Um, I mean, I'm partial to stronger tastes uh, myself. Um, okay, such I, as? I mean, I like coffee. I've become mm. a kind of a coffee uh uh, espresso uh, aficionado, so you know I All like right. good espresso. Yeah, um, I yeah. like single malt uh, scotch. I, okay. I have a single malt scotch habit, you know, right. and uh, um, you know I've developed a greater appreciation for the processes that make that produce these uh, uh, drinks and you know, just the great craft and tradition right. that, that goes into them. Um, um, okay. Uh, so those are a couple of things that, uh, that I like. I mean, my problem, as I mentioned in the book, is that being a non-taster right, right. means you're genetically, some, in general, a little less sensitive to, okay. in terms of your taste. So your palate is not really a finely tuned instrument mm. um, like some, some people's are. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fine, you know, sommeliers, for example. Yeah, so... Um, I uh, so I feel like I'm always trying to overcome that on a certain level. I feel like I'm kind of reaching it when I'm tasting like a good wine or something. Uh -huh. I feel like uh -huh. I'm yeah. I can see this is really complicated, but I you know I can't quite. It's all so a little bit foggy to me. Right, really, right. You know, and I find that frustrating. But you know I so I but I work to overcome it. So. All right, cool. I got that. So uh, my second question is. You know, you, maybe you answered it. I, I don't know. But my second question is, what taste do you hate or just really, really dislike? Um, I don't like anchovies. Um, okay, right. Okay. <laughs> um, partly because of the way they look, because they're All right. their entire little fish, but also they have a very strong fishy flavor. Right. Um, I'm also not partial to... Uh, Liver. Okay, um, so right, liver. My my wife likes both of these things, and so <laughs> we have this kind of semi regular uh, conflict where she uh, you know, orders something with anchovies, and I right. say no, no, I can't, I can't deal with that. Um, okay, okay. So uh, so those are a couple of things. Uh, um, 
in in the book I describe, you know, I took my family to Iceland and we went and had some hakarl, which is this mm -hmm. fermented uh, shark meat, shark, um, okay, okay. which is really the worst thing in the world. Uh, it had it uh, smells and tastes like a combination of ammonia and and rotting fish. So okay, that's really bad. But right. you, you you eat it just to say that you. You did it, so right, we, we right. did it, and yeah. uh, it was uh, it was a worthwhile experience. All right, cool. So scratch it off your bucket list then. Yeah, I, yes. ate, I ate this uh, Icelandic fish. <laughs> That's exactly. All right. So my last question is, John, if there was one thing and only one thing that you could do for the rest of your life, uh, like a cause or an activity, something other than what you're presently doing, uh, what would it be, and why would you commit yourself to it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I would probably um, opt to do something uh, regarding uh, well, global change uh, of some kind, you know, uh, involving uh, development of alternative energy sources, for example, okay. or decarbonization, you know, something that is an important issue that is growing. Um, in importance, and yet you know the technology and understanding is still kind of kind of vague. So, okay. um, or you know something like uh, um, in uh, international development, uh, uh, fighting diseases in Africa or, or whatever. You know that's something that's also very important, and right. where you know a combination of uh, eff you know, human effort and uh, Technology and policy can can make a real difference in the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, both of those things uh, appeal to me. If I um, if I uh, could do that, I probably would. So, uh, all right, uh, maybe I will. Who knows? All right, yeah, who knows? I got that. Okay, so in closing, the book is Tasty: The Art and Science of What We Eat. The author is John McQuaid, and you can catch his book at his website, TastyBook.net. That's T-A-S-T-Y book, single word, just one word, dot net. So, John, thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much for being an author story. It was very interesting, I must say. And I'm sure our listeners picked up a thing or two about you know, the ins and outs of taste and all that stuff. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. All right, cool. And we will be back next time on Author Story with another inspiring author. <laughs>